Good day to you. Do you have a headache at this point in the course? Have you had a headache in this course like I have? Like I have had? Yeah, a metaphorical headache from reading this book. Has it turned your world upside down? Have you been reading it? Have you been digging into it? To expose, to expose what's been happening with the way that we use social media. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to read a book like this. It's hard to take a look at a Facebook scroll like I have here. This is my Facebook. And I'm looking at Todd Smith here, a friend of mine, lives in California now. He likes the Home Depot. Oh, he's working for Home Depot right now on the web. Yeah, sharing that. And here's somebody named Carolyn Chun I've never met, but I belong to a similar fan club that she does, the same fan club, the Rolling Stones. She's showing a baseball stadium. Is she getting text messages and links in the local area about ice cream places to visit after the game? Here's some political stuff, presumably political, but is this data just being mined so that this person here, Charles Cromer, can be sold to deliver a campaign contribution to somebody that fits in with that particular philosophy, the political philosophy. The web is infested with money-making. It's a gargantuan money-making operation, and yet we believe every day that we're sharing things, that we're checking in with friends, that we're notifying people where we are, that we're finding out what's going on with others. Yeah, that's what we're really doing, right? No, that's where the headache comes in because we're being exploited. And that's something that we should take a look at because human beings are more valuable than that, right? So let's dig into our final chapter here. It's a conclusion. It's a conclusion chapter. It's called Social Media and Its Alternatives. It's all about moving towards a truly social media in the author's contention. And once again, you don't have to agree with all or even most of what the author is saying. That's what makes you an academic. You can have a detached perspective. But awakening should be a part of any study of any phenomenon in the academy. And that's what we're doing here. So the author, Fuchs, it's no secret. He says social media are pretty much the, the subject of a lot of myth-making throughout our discussions of it. We talk about its potential, about its promise, about how it's sharing. There's a lot of myths about promises that the social media deliver. One of them being that technological determinism is going to make it possible for technology to solve our problems. It's not. The author shows that consistently throughout the book that technology is not responsible for social movements. It's not responsible for erasing economic inequalities across the world. Far from it. Technology is a tool of business. So what you need to look at is not technology. You can't talk about the promise of the latest iPhone, what it's going to let. The iPhone's going to allow you to FaceTime with your parents. What a wonderful invention. Well, yeah, but that's so much more subsumed to the idea that humans, humans are the ones, humans are the ones who are stuck where they are based on power relations that exist. And only human beings can make those changes, not technology. And so what's needed is the basis for the book. The basis undergirding of this book is a critical theory. It's a critical theory. The name of this course is Critical Perspectives on Social Media Use. This is a critical theory. It's theory that's used critically to expose contradictions in the profit-making system. And critical theory is informed a lot by political economy theory and what the author calls critical political economy theory, looking at the economy and politics and how it is entrapped within a larger ideology that, that subsumes those ostensibly good things that we should have happening, politics and economics, subsumes them, pushes them down under to advertising and profit-making interests. So what is, what is involved here? Well, essentially, the internet is exploiting us. That's, that's the essence. That's where Marx comes in, Marx's principal plank in his doctrine, if you want to call it that, his philosophy was the exploitation is going on all the time at the expense of capital accumulation. That companies, profit-making companies on the internet, social media companies included, they are trying to maximize their capital. They're trying to accumulate capital all the time. And what that means is to try and get people to work for free. It means to try and get people to buy stuff that they don't need. It gets, means trying to get people to work long hours. It means a lot of things that are not 
uh, moving the or not advancing the interests of human beings. And it, all the while, we are fooled by some of the myths that exist. Like we have a myth that Google is a is a search engine. It's the number one search engine. No, the author says it's not a search engine at all. It's the world's largest advertising agency. That's all it is. It's all about advertising, Google. That's what it is. And furthermore, that we have accepted the idea of, of surveillance as a good thing, that it's helping us feel safe, when actually what we have is a surveillance industrial complex. And it's gotten us not to feel safe, but it's gotten us to help offer more information about our private lives that can then be mined by companies wishing to sell us stuff. And in the meantime, does the surveillance make us feel any safer? If you have an alarm in your house, I don't have one. I don't want to get one because I've seen people who have them. They worry all the time. Did they, did they remember the code? Did they get to the code in enough time? Did they turn it on before they left? If somebody's coming over, their child, does a child know how to get in the house? These are worries that come out. Surveillance is supposed to make you feel safer and calmer. I don't see that happening with, with simple alarm systems. So I, I expand that to the internet and I think of the same thing as going on, the industrial complex of surveillance. All the cameras, all the ways that you're tracked through cookies, every time you turn your phone on, the IP address, every time you make a phone call, there's massive surveillance going on. It's a complex and it's coming not just from companies, it's coming from Big Brother. Every time you make a phone call overseas, that's going, that's, you're, being, you're being listened to by the National Security Agency, or at least there's text of that conversation. And all of this is going into big capital, really big capital accumulation made possible by big data, which we've referenced time and time again. And within the exploitation that goes on, the boundary between work and play becomes very fuzzy. Like, when do you stop working? When, when do you stop selling your labor for, for a company's profit benefit? And when do you start just to have play? enjoy yourself. You know, where you're not actually selling something. Well, that, that is so far because you can be at your, your kid's baseball game. You could be taking a hike on the Appalachian Trail and just posting a photo. You're working. You're working for whatever company is, for Facebook for sure, and whatever company is going to employ your, your skills to get you to help share more of what they're trying to sell. So there's a lot of false claims that are being made about social media that, in terms of them advancing human interests when, when they're not. There's a lot of exploitation that's at the basis of it. And a theorist, Jaron Lanier, says that it's totally commodified, the internet. It's totally commodified. And the reason for that is we want free use of the internet so badly. We want it to be for free that we will sign up for anything. We will log on through Facebook. We will collect any box that says, I agree to these terms when what we are really doing is selling ourselves. We want the internet to be free so badly, we don't care if we're not paid for our information. Is that not really astounding? Lanier argues that all digital labor should be remunerated, paid for. Every time you're on the internet, every time you post something, you should be paid. That's an idealistic world, but it's an important idea to think about. Now we talk about capitalism. Capitalism is the basis for our society. It's the basis you find it in Japan too. You can find it in China, um, although it's within a communist framework. You can find it in Europe, although it's within a socialist framework. There's a lot of capitalism. All forms of capitalism, though, are contradictory because they create crises. We don't see them as crises of capitalism. We see them as other micro crises, like the crash that happened in 2008 in the real estate market. That's a crisis of capitalism. But we would say, oh, no, that's a natural downturn in the market. The stock market has its highs. It has its lows. The bubble was too big for the real estate market. It crashed. It's the economy. No, that's inherent to capitalism. It has these swings. It has these crashes. And that crash had real consequences. Many of you have student loan debt today that is just absolutely astronomical because during that crash, tuition was rising. Tuition was rising. People couldn't afford it. And so student loans started to go up as well. But why was tuition rising? Because state, state funding was going down. Why was state funding going down? Because tax collection was not as high, because people didn't have as much money, because of the crash in the market. So this is a way of looking at it. You don't have to necessarily agree with it, but this is a way of looking at capitalism. It's crisis ridden. In the 2008 downturn, you won't think of it as a crisis of capitalism that's affected you and your student loan right now. You might look at, oh, those are the old days. That's old school. That's back then. I'm just trying to just trying to get my degree. That's the inherent nature of capitalism. So what does the author say could start to move us towards a truly social media, a true social media? First of all, the author says we need to continue to work on data 
protection laws. Data protection laws that protect consumer interests. You know those three times that Facebook was fined? How much of your bank records have been handed over? How many companies know that you've bought food at ShopRite or that you have paid for uh, something on Amazon on the internet? or that you've eaten at a restaurant. How many other businesses know about that? How many other governments know about that? There are data protection laws that can stop that from happening against your interests. And yet at the same time, we need to have some data protection that allows us to see what's going on. In the case of Sweden, for example, every time a prime minister travels abroad, those credit card purchases are immediately made open to the public as per Swedish law. That's a kind of da data protection, but it's in favor of making sure that you know how public officials are spending tax dollars. Next up is something called opt-in advertising policies. This is where you have policies that, that do not allow you to opt, that do not make you be responsible for opting out, but ask you if you want to opt in. And that means you're basically agreeing to have your cookies tracked, otherwise you don't want them tracked. Then there's the idea of corporate watch programs. This happens as a multi-pronged attack. It's basically the struggle against the surveillance industrial complex. And this struggle has to come from all kinds of areas of the world. There are exam or areas of society, sectors of society. There are examples given on page 348 where the author talks about, oh, there are, you know, all these, all these right here. These are all corporate watch groups online. And to drive it home, the author says we need these because children have become lucrative targets for data mining companies. Just weeks after Google settled a lawsuit for selling student data for advertising, the publication revealed an entire industry devoted to marketing data gathered from internet applications offered to students and their teachers. That's you there, and also younger people as well. So we need corporate watch programs basically to resist asymmetrical power to keep those corporations not as the dominant players in the social media sphere. Also, the author says that we need digital labor unions. Unions. Unions improve uh, working conditions of every single person who's working right now on the internet. Make sure that you have uh, uh, minimum wages, for example, working hours, for example, working conditions, um, perhaps content that you're forced to work on that you don't want to work on. There's a lot of areas of worker rights that are born out of union movements from the 1800s. They used to be more concerned with, with um, physical work conditions because people were working in factories that were very dirty bad lighting and stuff, but now it's more about digital worker rights and the idea of digital labor unions. Also, the author says that there should be alternative internet platforms. Wikipedia was one that was kind of discussed in class, but the essence of these is they should all be advertising free. Advertising corrupts the uh, distribution of, of knowledge by making a, a profitable commodity. These, these uh, sites should be advertising free. They should have free access. You shouldn't have to pay to get to them. And they should be financed by donations uh, like Wikipedia is. I'm not sure that that's a model that really works and the donations then become, to me, corporate donations. And then you're back to the same problem. Or at least that can happen. And then we have uh, the advertising tax, which is uh, promoted by the author. It's to tax people who are advertising on the internet. They are, after all, making millions and millions of dollars. Why not take taxes a sliver, tiny little sliver from Google and Facebook and apply that towards funding, funding a cooperative. And so that's where we move to now in the final comments for today's instructor video. And that is, what is a truly social media look like? Well, a truly social media is, is a cooperative information society. That's what it is. It's a participatory democracy. It's where privacy is strengthened. Whose privacy? Yours? Yeah, yours. The consumers, the individuals, not the privacy of corporations. Don't you want to know where Google and Facebook are investing monies? Don't you want to know exactly when somebody clicks through one of your posts that you've shared and then monies are sent to some advertiser or advertise golf clubs or whatever on that site. Don't you want to know that trail? Whose information should be pr protected? The privacy of consumers. And then also there should be combined efforts to achieve the commons-based internet. That was discussed in one of the chapters and particularly under Wikipedia and a little bit under Twitter, but it's the idea that you have copyright laws 
that are assuring that the internet will be free and open and that you can take material off it and it's, you don't have to worry about paying somebody for it and you don't have to worry about somebody making money off the internet. There's a, it's a multi-pronged effort to achieve that commons-based internet. Let us remember as we wrap things up here that humans, we're social beings. Yeah, we, we need to be with other humans. If we don't, we feel lonely and isolated. In fact, the strongest punishment that we can have short of capital punishment, which is death, the strongest punishment that we can do to a person is to put them in solitary confinement, which is essentially to stop them from socializing with others. Today, we depend on our phones to socialize so very much it's, it's really impossible to return to a previous era where we expect people and students not to be on their phones. And so we have to take a look at media and the role of social media in advancing our efforts as social beings. In essence, would you not agree that human beings are at their best when they collaborate on their own volition, when people decide to work together to build a community garden, when people work together to decide to put a pond in that everybody can fish in, when people decide to work together to sit around and, and joke, that's, that's what human life is really all about. That's when people are at their happiest. So how do we achieve that? Well, some final thoughts on page 356. Humans need to collaborate in order to exist. A collaborative society requires participatory democracy and collective ownership and control of the means of production. Collaboration and cooperation are the fundamental meanings of the terms societal and social. Discussions about social media remind us of the need to think and act in respect to, to the question about what sociality is what society and what kind of media we want to have. His final sentence is social media are possible. Think about that. Have a great day.